can't okay continue here on my end as well um so thank you for having me um it, i was going to do this live for uh for the ag breakfast but um this is this is just as good except for the except there's no food so maybe not quite as good anyway uh this talk's called gmos the what how and why it was actually developed uh, from our extension folk um i kind of added a few slides of my own um, it's a topic that I've really enjoyed, and uh, genetic modification of plants is really what got me into the plant sciences in general. So um, I just, I've, I've always found it very, very fascinating, and I hope you enjoy it as well. So um, the objectives are going to be, you know, what are the GMOs, um, why do we have them, uh, what are the concerns, and how do we make them? I think by answering those questions, it really gives people a solid foundation on discussing them and understanding why they're here and um, how, how they're made and even safety concerns are kind of um, answered with these questions as well. Um, so let's go ahead and start with this slide, which is essentially um, labeling. Um, labeling has been a very controversial topic with genetic modification. Um, and I just kind of want to show you this. It's, it's a very, um, it's a very profound, um, type of uh, marketing. Um, it's, uh, it's very impactful. Um, it, does, it does create a lot of, um, I want to say, um, there's a lot of information there, but it also creates a lot of misconceptions. Um, so with, with marketing, marketing is just a very strong tool. Um, and then with the, uh, with, with the uh, when we're talking about GMO specifically, um, it really kind of um, steers things, not maybe so, sometimes in the um, misconception type uh, type gray areas. Um, and uh, it's just it's just out there, and the more you know, the better you can make decisions for yourself. Um, not to say that it's right and wrong, but um, I think it does kind of leave out a lot of essential information sometimes. Um, and then we see it on uh, we see it every day when we're doing um, grocery shopping. Um, you know, things like even on the SpaghettiOs, it says uh, this product contains genetically modified material. Um, and if that's the only thing you know, um, that can be a scary thing um, to, to, to read. And it's just, um, I, think, I think with genetic modification of food specifically, um, because food is such an essential part of our culture, uh, it's, such, it's something that we identify with. Um, it's very traditional. Um, we identify with food whenever there are people manipulating it that maybe we don't quite understand why and what they're doing. I think people really take it personally um, and then just form opinions uh, very quickly and maybe not with all, with, with all the facts. And like I said, uh, with the marketing on top of that, um, it just becomes a very um, misconstrued type, uh, type of uh, science. So let's go ahead and talk about biotechnology and its history. Um, on the upper right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, there it is. Um, we have Dolly the sheep. Um, this was the first cloning of an animal in 1996. Um, what it was, uh, it was a major science breakthrough and um, they were able to, using a surrogate lamb, they were able to, or a surrogate sheep, they were able to, uh, to clone Dolly, and um, it was the first of its kind, and it really just kind of uh, illustrated the progress that we were making with genetic engineering. Um, you can also see uh, this time chart down here where it shows a percentage of total planted area, and this is in the U.S., starting from 96, uh, where Dolly just kind of came in the picture, um, but it kind of shows that there were very minimal uh, transgenic uh, crops on the market, just lost my cursor, there it is, okay. But then by the time we got to 2003, so in a matter of seven years, um, even even before that, five, six years, uh, the majority of our crops, specifically soybeans um, and cotton, um, corn, corn kind of had a little dip there, but it was still increasing in terms of trends as an adoption to agriculture. Um, so we're gonna talk about why that is. Okay. All right. A lot of animation there. Okay. So what are GMOs? 
The definition of GMOs right here in front of you, um, plants, animals, or microorganisms in which genetic material, so DNA is what we're talking about, has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. Um, and that's from the World Health Organization. And this is an organization that we've heard a lot about lately. <laughs> um, most GMOs are referring to, uh, to a seed that has been created with a gene from one species and is transferred into another species. Um, usually when we talk about GMOs, we are talking about plants um, and uh, other terms that we use as transgenic or genetic engineering. So um, I wanna highlight this. This is one of my favorite slides and it kind of shows you about 20 crops um, that we use globally and where they originated from. You got soybeans out in the east, uh, rice east as well. Um, then you have things like peanut, um, tomato, corn, sunflower, all in the, the western part of the world. And even in Europe, in the old country, uh, sugar beets, grapes, um, you got sorghum in Africa. But um, crops come from a very wide range of climates. Uh, they come from different countries, different types of soil. Um, so they are, uh, they're very specific in terms of um, their origins. Um, so in terms of just kind of more numbers that you hear, uh, plant species facts. Um, there are around 10,000 plant species that have been used for human food since the uh, origin, origin of agriculture. Um, today we have about 150. And this is where uh, we get into the reasons why we use genetic modification. 12 plant species provide 70% of the world's food. Um, and then the fourth bullet there, four plants. So we have rice, maize, which is corn, wheat, and potatoes make up over 50% of the world's food supply. Um, and if, if you want to break it down further, 30 crops provide 90% of the world's calorie intake. Um, global population has been going up, up, and up um, in an exponential fashion. So agriculture has to be um, more and more productive because we are losing more farm ground as, as time progresses and the crops need to be more and more efficient to feed the population. Um, so genetic modification was one of those tools that we used. Um, so even further history here um, kind of shows you how agriculture has evolved and how it has evolved into uh, genetic modification um, and has really taken a lead role in the sciences, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, it, it, this, so this chart, it, it's really interesting. It starts all the way back in 30,000 BC when humans were artificially selecting wolves to be companion animals um, or work dogs or just animals uh, to have around. And um, so that's been, so the breeding, the uh, selective breeding of animals has been going on. It's probably one of the oldest practices if you think of culture. Um, and then we start, it wasn't until 8,000 BC that we started doing the same for plants. And then it was in the 70s that we started doing a little bit more um, work in terms of genetics and uh, molecular work. And it wasn't till, um, actually here, let's, uh, let's one more, I can't keep losing my cursor here. But in the 80s, it's interesting because, you know, even though when we talk about genetic modification, we're usually talking about plants. But in the 80s, uh, the pharmaceutical companies started doing genetic modification as well for um, pharmaceutical uh, products. So in this case, it's human insulin. Um, before this, people used, or uh, the, the way that pharmaceuticals got insulin for diabetics was to isolate them from pigs. And then we, the, the diabetics would receive insulin from, from, from pigs, from a different animal, for a different species. Um, and then with genetic modification that started happening in the late 70s there, um, we were able to put the human insulin gene in things like yeast, um, sometimes bacteria. I would, uh, I'm not sure exactly which one they used, but they started putting them in these, uh, these uh, unicellular organisms um, to, to then make human insulin so that diabetics can now get um, human insulin as opposed to pig insulin. Um, so really genetic modification started in the 80s, but really didn't start 
um, getting a lot of publicity until the 90s uh, when they started messing with tomatoes. In this case, uh, the flavor saver tomatoes became the first genetically engineered food crop in 92. Um, that was approved by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, that really didn't hit the market because of all the controversy that came after that. Um, but then corn followed suit, and um, at the bottom there, golden rice, and we can talk about that later. But that's kind of the timeline that things were happening. Um, and I'm going to back up a little bit, and I'm going to show you this picture, and this is, this is cabbage. Um, and all these are cabbages. And it just shows you that human selection can really have a profound um, effect on the physiology of crops. So just so all those years from seven, eight thousand BC that we were doing human selection, we have really modified those crops that we saw in that first slide and like where all the different crops came from um, into looking the way that we want. Um, agriculture is a very close knit relationship between humans and plants in a way that they have both become interdependent on one another. Uh, most crops cannot just, you can't just throw seeds out there and they'll just prolifer proliferate and just um, give you great yields. It does require human intervention to cultivate that. Um, and in turn, those crops then allow for the, for the nutritional needs and demands of culture of uh, large villages and larger cities and even uh, metropolises anymore. So this relationship was essentially developed um, when we started um, so not, or when we started human selection for crops. And you can just kind of see the variation that we see in cabbages. Um, here's corn, you know, early corn, the teosente on the far left side of your screen. You know, just kind of look like foxtail. <laughs> and then we've read it into this huge kernel that is just full of calories. Um, and we can get a lot of calories per acre uh, by planting corn. All right. So we've got some new people coming in here. Um, and here's just kind of a cartoon de depiction of that. Um, you can kind of see teosente and corn. Um, the similarities, but also the grand differences in terms of uh, the food that's supplied. In this case, well, I would say in 99% of the cases for agriculture, um, when we're talking about food, uh, agriculture foods that we eat, um, we're breeding for calories as opposed to anything else. Um, and, and by doing so, you know, we lose a lot of the, um, the other characteristics that make it, that make the crop stand alone. Um, so that interdependency just becomes more and more um, necessary. So um, how much are we manipulating when we're doing all these different practices? Um, here we have a timeline and it shows uh, selective breeding, what we were talking about um, from 10,000 years ago till today. Um, all you do is pick two things that you like and breed them and breed them and breed them for thousands of years. Um, we're talking about um, thousands and thousands of generations. Um, and then you, you improve things and the amount of genes that are modified in that process is anywhere between 10,000 and 300,000. But this takes 10,000 years. It takes so many, so many years that um, you almost feel like in a lifetime you've made no progress. Um, but um, after many, many, many generations, uh, you can start seeing the progress. Um, and then you can do things like interspecies crosses that started in the 1800s. Um, in this case, it's breeding and tissue culture techniques that permit genetic exchange between plants not crossing naturally. Um, so you can start, um, so in this case, uh, this technique, it's a little outdated, um, but uh, they, uh, but using cell cultures, um, the plant, uh, plants are easy to, uh, they, they really have two uh, hormones that uh, really regulate uh, how they develop. And uh, you can make a callus growth and uh, there, there's a lot of recombination that way as well. Uh, mutagenesis was a process that they used in the 1930s. Um, in this case, they take uh, radiation and they're able to modify the chromosomes of these plants by, in this case, it's breaking and then recombination um, using mutagenesis. So um, 
typically it's uh, x-rays and um, radiation. So uh, yeah, x-rays were, were the big ones at the, at the time as well that I remember reading about. Um, but then it's kind of like selective breeding where you're just randomly making mutations um, and then you see what happens and then you select the things you like. And as soon as you like them, you start propagating them that way. So it's a lot quicker to uh, get modifications you want that way. And then um, from the 1990s till today, uh, we have tr uh, transgenesis. So the GMOs where we can selectively target either inserting a gene of, the, of, um, of interest or removing something that has a negative effect that we don't want. Um, and then in this case, we're talking about instant changes and um, this occurs, um, we're really manipulating one of three genes typically when we do this kind of modification. Um, and it is uh, easy to figure out where that modification typically goes as opposed to mutagenesis um, and interspecies crosses that take a lot, that are a lot more random and um, would take a lot more work to figure out where that gene is. Um, so it's, that's kind of uh, a picture of um, how crops change really. Um, and it's just a good thing to understand in terms of uh, why we do certain things. So why would we want them in agriculture and food? All right. So um, this kind of jumps straight into some modifications and what they do. Uh, but I'm going to go back to my comment earlier about how we now have this very large population to feed um, using crops that we have been selectively breeding from 10,000 years ago. Um, and what happens is when we're selecting for certain characteristics, we're typically selecting for food production, for calories. Um, and insects are rapidly evolving on the outside looking in um, and we're not allowing the plants to co-evolve with the insects the way it's always been done. Um, but in turn, that the, you know, the reason for that co-evolution is for resistance as opposed to that cultural um, relationship that we have in agriculture where we're breeding for food production. So, um, there, so, and so some of the modifications that we've done here is um, Beet, so in this case, it's BT, um, insect resistance. Um, and then what we're doing is we're taking genes that are transferred uh, that will produce bacterial proteins that kill insects. So um, one of the problems with corn is the corn borer. And we have, we have seen, it's always been known that Bacillus thermogensis, that's where BT gets its name, is a bacteria that makes this protein that is very toxic to moth-like pests um, when they feed on on this, uh, on this bacteria. Um, in the past, before genetic modification, we combated these pests through uh, pesticides. Um, in this case, BT, uh, it's, on, it's in the bacteria. You can either purify it out of the bacteria or you could even use the bacteria suspension on your crop um, and you were able to get modific and you were able to get resistance, or I'm sorry, um, um, insect insecticidal uh, properties out of it because the moth would eat this and, and it would die. Um, but BT has been shown to not be toxic to mammals um, and even bees and other insects as well, or I'm sorry, and bees um, and similar insects to, to, to bees. Um, but for moth type organisms, BT is very toxic and it was a way um, to get over that uh, pest problem. Um, so one of the things that they, they realized was instead of uh, using this whole bacteria or that purification process, they could insert just the gene inside the plant. The plant, the plant could make it. Um, it doesn't affect any of the physiology of the plant. Um, when we consume it, a BT is everywhere. So we can consume it whether we know, we know it or not. Um, we, it, when we eat this plant now, we're not, um, we're not getting sick. And now we have an insecticide that is safer than many things that do kill um, boars, um, but, uh, but in a way, and, and even with less input, so we can keep making uh, very large fields of, um, of, of food. Um, and in this case, BT proteins um, can be certified organic. In this case, as long as they're not, um, as long as the crop isn't genetically modified with the transgene. 
Um, and it just kind of shows you how that, how that works. Um, you know, you'll have that crystalline toxin um, and it's eaten by the caterpillar. It binds to specific gut receptors of moth type organisms and it kills it. Um, but just like I was talking about with, uh, with evolution, uh, you know, these insects, you're, you're always, whenever you have um, something that has a high mortality rate, uh, there's always gonna be variations in the population. And as you have that uh, variation, the ones that are more resilient, resistant sometimes are gonna reproduce. And after a few generations, um, you can actually get resistance to, um, to certain things. So um, there has been resistance in BT as shown in this picture. You can kind of see the top of this bottom field um, down here. Uh, there's, uh, there's one type of BT up here and one type down here. Um, and it shows that it's gonna be the similar pest all throughout this field. But um, even though they're both classified as BT type proteins, um, there's gonna be variations in, in the type, a little, uh, just subtle variations that are very specific um, to, that, to that gut receptor and certain, certain ones are going to be resistant to it. So they've had, they've, they've modified them. In this case, it's CRY3B1 and CRY3-4. Um, another thing that we make them for is herbicide tolerance. So uh, genes are inserted into crops that provide resistance from herbicides. In this case, uh, this gene comes from agrobacterium um, and a glufosinate, so uh, Liberty, let me see here, my cursor just keeps disappearing. So this is, so glyphosate is, comes from agrobacterium. This is, would be something like Roundup and glufosinate comes from Streptomyces, which is something like Liberty. Uh, so in this case, we want to maintain that level of crop production by utilizing certain herbicides that are going to be less toxic to people, easier to handle um, and uh, functional in terms of uh, their, their potency for, um, for, for, uh, for, herb, for, as an herbicide, I should say. I kept wanting to say herbivory, but that's not quite the, the word I wanted. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at these quotes here, herbicide tolerant cotton saved 15.5 million kilograms of herbicide since 96 to 2011. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a cotton example, so we're talking about fiber, but I could say something very similar in terms of corn, soybeans, and rice. Well, I mean, well not, not rice, but corn and soybeans. Um, so some people would say that um, the more, the more, like there's been an increase in use of herbicides with genetic modification. Um, and, you know, if you actually look at the data here, um, it, it kind of shows the opposite. So you have, um, so in this, this blue line here is herbicides used from 88 to 2008. Um, and there's actually a downward trend here that we're seeing. Um, insecticides from 88 to 2008, another downward trend. Um, so herbicides and insecticides are the two biggest genetic modifications that we do. Um, and I'm gonna say that not only is there this trend downward, if you remember, uh, genetically modified crops kind of came in the market in the late 90s. Um, but not only is there a downward trend that we're using less of them, but the, the trade-off from something like glyphosate and um, uh, other herbicides that we would use like, um, um, help me here. Um, oh, I can't, I'm blanking right now. Um, but there were more toxic herbicides that we were using in the past. So there is a safety, um, there's the, the safety level that we're also looking at when we are deciding on what our herbicide tolerance to use in terms of transgenes and plants. Um, all right. Okay, so that was, um, so that, that's, those are the trends that I kind of wanted to show. But I also kind of wanted to show this, kind of highlighting some of the uh, safety concerns in terms of the LD levels. Um, one of the regulatory authorities for genetic modified crops is the FDA. Um, the FDA is also the regulatory authority for um, our, me our medication, our drugs. Um, and they, what they do is they classify things um, in terms of lethal dose. So things undergo a, um, 
a series of tests, and one of those tests is the LD level. So some people call it the LD50. And the LD50 is a concentration of milligrams per kilograms ingested that would kill 50% of a population. Um, typically, it's done in mammals, um, and it kind of works its way up to um, well, starting with mice and working their way up to more complex mammals. Um, but one of, the, one of the ideas here is the less milligrams per weight of a substance it takes to kill something, the more toxic it is. Um, so everything has an LD level that we basically see. Um, table salt has an LD level of 3,200. So that would take 3,200 milligrams per kilogram weight to kill you. Um, and that would kind of fall into this slightly toxic category. Caffeine, 200 milligrams per kilogram. Um, caffeine is something that's very toxic. I remember in high school when it came out with caffeine pills, kids were overdosing on it. Um, caffeine has a moderately toxic rating in terms of an LD level. Gasoline, I like to show gasoline because it's highly toxic and we know this. Um, gasoline is a good example to contrast with glyphosate um, because we don't eat glyphosate, we handle glyphosate, and we handle gasoline. Um, I'm sure we don't wear gloves when we put gasoline in our trucks, when we, when we fill up our lawnmowers and that stuff spills over and gets all over us. Um, but it's a, it's a lot more toxic than Roundup according to the LD level. Um, so there is uh, there is a there is a safety concern with um, uh, with usage of herbicides that's uh, that's built into a lot of these decisions that are made for herbicide tolerant crops. Atrazine was the example that I just blanked on earlier. Um, atrazine was something that people kind of got away from because they were just, it was just so much easier to handle Roundup resistant crops, so glyphosate resistant crops. Uh, rather than using atrazine, um, you know, and that and that came with its own uh, story as well. But um, you know, if you think about atrazine, it's a lot more toxic than something like glyphosate. So, what are some of the commonly modified crops that we have? Okay, we have. So here's a chart that shows a percentage use of acres, um, and this was from. It wasn't. It, this is a few years old, but it's still pretty relevant. I think we have a few more to add to this list. But so IR means insect resistance and HT means herbicide tolerance. There's a key down at the bottom there. So as far as cotton goes, 96% of the cotton that we, that we have is either insect resistance, herbicide resistance, or both. Sugar beets, herbicide, toler or herbicide um, tolerance. Soybeans, corn, insect resistance, herbicide tolerance, and um, DT, which is drought tolerance. Uh, so there are some drought tolerant genes as well. And this is where we get to things that really aren't, um, well, I guess in this case, it technically is tied to production, but in a roundabout way. Um, and it's probably very uh, specific to environment. Uh, canola and papaya has a virus resistant gene. The papaya industry comes from typically Hawaii and papayas would have been extinct had the genetic modified papaya had not taken over and saved the crop in Hawaii. Um, alfalfa, and alfalfa seems, to me it's kind of underrepresented here. Um, we have herbicide tolerance now. We also have low lignin varieties that OSU has just helped develop. Um, so with alfalfa, there's a quality factor that, of interest with genetic modification as well. And then, um, even uh, squash now, we're starting to get some produce that are falling into this category as well. All right, um, so that's just kind of a good overview of what crops are genetically modified. Um, you know, and, and I will say that um, on the other side that we alluded to a little bit um, on the, uh, the pharmaceutical side, most drugs that can be developed genetically modified through um, either yeast or E. coli or, um, e. coli or just different uh, bacteria types, um, they, that is the best way to produce that, those types of drugs that can be, that can be used like that. Um, as far as planted acres here, um, we can see that soybeans have dominated as far as um, genetic modification in terms of the, the fields 
that we plant them in the in this country. Um, and you can see that everything is trending upwards because the demand for production has gone up with it. Um, as you can see, most of the traits that we talk about when we talk about genetic modification are things that increase production. Um, and um, they are, they are because of the higher demand of production, um, there also is a higher demand for these crops in terms of the adoption. Um, here are some, some things that have been modified here. Um, BT cotton. Uh, we talked a lot about cotton. We didn't talk about the flavor saver tomato. Uh, that actually has not hit the market. Um, what it, the, the way the flavor saver tomato worked um, was a lot of times, you know, it's just like if you have any kind of fruit in your house, um, it'll start ripening with the addition of ethylene. Um, you know how they say one bad apple spoils a bunch? As fruit ripens, it emits ethylene, which then triggers the... Um, maturation of fruits and accelerates that. And it's what it does is it starts breaking down the cell wall, makes, it makes it uh, sweeter. So if you think about bananas, they go from very starchy to very sweet as they, as they get more and more mature um, or ripen, I should say. And um, it, it's actually, it's just something that's found in nature um, and it's a way to attract uh, animals and um, other, other things that can eat the seed and uh, spread the seed that way. But from an agricultural standpoint or transportation standpoint, um, what they do is they make, they, they make it less ethylene sensitive by modifying some cell wall genes there. Golden rice was a very big project with a lot of high hopes. Um, in Southeast Asia, there was a, the, 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 the population's very high um, and the the necessity for high caloric production is very high as well to feed that population. Um, in terms of poor countries, uh, rice is the main, the staple food uh, food source in those countries. And what was happening there was um, most families maybe had a little bit of meat, but but there was a there was a hierarchy of um, of, of how you eat these meals. So typically, the father would eat the meat followed by them, the mother, the eldest son, and then the younger kids would end up with just rice, just white rice. Um, and the problem with that is that we were seeing a lot of blindness from, uh, from vitamin A deficiencies. So um, these kids weren't getting enough vitamin A and then going blind. So what they did was they started producing beta carotene, which is pro-vitamin A in the rice, so that they could plant this rice using the same cultural methods, the same um, same uh, cult cultivars that they were using before, so they wouldn't have to change anything. And then hopefully now you're, you're able to introduce pro-vitamin A into the population without manipulating any of the, uh, the cultural changes that came with that manipulation. If you remember from earlier, um, in the insertion of a gene can only, sometimes modifies only one to three uh, genes if you're using transgenic uh, means, and you're able to maintain that um, that cultural aspect of uh, agriculture using uh, this type of technology. Um, golden rice uh, really didn't get off the, the market um, until, uh, I don't know, I, I would, there was, a, there was a, a lot of controversy with golden rice again. Um, and uh, actually the original golden rice was made from a daffodil gene um, and the beta carotene uh, process or a pathway. Um, and one of the reasons why it was pulled off the market was because they voted that um, because it came from a toxic plant, so daffodils are toxic if you eat them, um, then that has no place in, uh, in the food chain. So one of the stipulations with genetic modified foods is um, it can't come from a plant that's either high allergen uh, potential or is toxic. Um, even though it's not producing the toxic substance, it still came from that plant. Um, and that's kind of how they were able to pull golden rice from the market. Um, you know, a, so the transformation of plant cells, I, I like to show this because it's actually something that is found in nature. Um, <laughs> nature Magazine at the bottom. No, but it's, uh, there's a bacteria out there called agrobacterium and it's everywhere. Um, and what it does is it's, it causes these galls to happen. In this case, it's from one of our fact sheets 
uh, crown gall on raspberry, uh, this, this uh, soil-borne bacteria will inject, um, it'll inject a piece of, a string of DNA into the plant cell. And what I was talking about, uh, plant hormones, it basically balances out the cytokinins and the auxins in the plant cell. And it causes this tumorous callus growth to ha happen. And on top of this, um, this, uh, this tDNA strand, this uh, gene vector, um, it also codes for things that for these um, for these uh, high nitrogen amine type, uh, uh, I guess proteins that um, would feed that these bacteria can grow on and uh, give some kind of food source, some energy from. And it, and its goal then not only did it modify the the uh, the cells around it, but it's also genetically engineering this plant to make food for the agrobacterium itself and house it. So it proliferates, pr prolifer pr I can't even talk, proliferates that way. Um, but it's something that, and what early on the scientists saw this phenomenon and what they did was they started putting their own genes in place of these genes that were feeding this bacteria um, and genetically modifying plants that way. Um, it was just, it was just something that they saw in nature took advantage of and um, are doing it that way. Uh, I would say that um, in laboratories, people are still doing that. Um, they're still using agrobacterium. I used agrobacterium 10 years ago in grad school, um, but uh, it's still, it still happens and it's something that was around. Um, so this is, so this kind of, um, this is how we see it in a lab. Um, you know, they take, they modify they modify a plasmid with uh, a gene of interest. Um, so it could be like the herbicide tolerance, the insecticide tolerance, drought tolerance, whatever. Um, and they're able to, uh, typically what they'll do is they'll dip the floral buds into this, into the, the agrobacterium uh, suspension. And if you get a transformation on an egg cell of a, of a plant that you want, and then you get that egg cell pollinated, um, then you, you end up with a seed with a stable uh, modification. And that's, that was how they uh, did them early on. Um, but you know, sometimes when we're talking about these changes, it's not really big changes. Um, with the way that uh, glyphosate works, plants have to engineer every amino acid we have to take in essential amino acids and we have branches off from there in terms of getting all 20 amino acids to make proteins. Uh, plants have to build them from scratch. So plants have pathways that don't exist in our bodies. Um, and in this case, for, for a glyphosate resistance, what you do is you modify a non-target site so that the glyphosate won't bind into, um, into the molecule and then render it uh, and, and uh, render it um, inactive uh, through this molecule. Um, we don't have this enzyme, so um, glyphosate has thought to be pretty inert in our bodies, as far as it doesn't have a binding site to it to latch onto. Um, but there, there was actually they noticed that um, other bacteria that have this pathway as well uh, had this slight modification that made it resistance to that substance. Um, and they were able to put it in plants. But we're really talking about, um, I wanna say it's just one or two amino acid changes uh, that changes kind of like the, the look of that molecule. Um, now, as we've progressed, um, we're using uh, these uh, fungal enzymes and they're able to modify site-specific gene editing, fast, simple, and cheap, um, instead of going through the process of a bacterial insertion that can be random, um, and I haven't identified where it is, we're able to find a specific gene and change it. Uh, some people seem to be okay with maybe not inserting a gene from a different plant into a crop, but just changing a, a little bit of the, um, uh, the, the, the code so where you're not inserting anything new, but you're getting a desired effect. And that's kind of the way um, the flavor saver tomato would work is you're modifying the gene that produces um, the substance that starts breaking down the cell wall on the outside. And then you have a tomato that um, lasts longer. Um, and it's called CRISPR. 
it's um it's out in the market uh this is just kind of a uh uh science paper de depiction of that um, but it's a very specific way to change and manipulate um genes in a uh, in a crop and um, i have a question about that one about crispr yeah how do we okay. know if a tomato that we've bought is a crispr tomato um i've like tried to pay attention to that because i'm curious i want to taste them how do we know if they're if a tomato that we've encountered is a, a crispr well if um if genetic modification and gmos work the way they should um there are no safety concerns as well as changes in flavor of that tomato um you know and then that that kind of goes back to the labeling and then we'll get into this a little bit like towards the end of this uh talk um whether labeling should be something that we do or not do um but um sometimes some states require labeling um is i think is how it goes and then some states do not so um honestly christine if it's not labeled you would never know unless That's, it's unle so funny because i want to shop to buy it on purpose not to avoid it and a lot of people are going to try to do the opposite but i've always wondered that I wanted to try it for myself and have firsthand testimonial that, you know, it tastes like a tomato, but I've never known if I've had one or not. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just a genetic way to do something that we can also do. If you think about, see, um, see how it says, uh, this is the PPO gene. So phenyl oxidase, this oxidase thing, um, oxidase is an enzyme that will start uh, oxidizing, put what it does is it, puts a, it, re, it uh, reduces a, a molecule and then it starts, it starts breaking down um, when it's exposed to oxygen. So if you think about the avocado example, an apple, you cut it in half and then it starts browning. That's an oxidase. So what are some ways that we can inhibit that enzyme is with lime juice. You put an acid, um, then that inhibits the enzyme from acting. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to just knock out that enzyme because it's, you know, it's, it doesn't serve us a purpose. It serves nature a purpose. Does that make sense? And nature, like breaking things down, smells, attract things. Um, we are, you know, we're, when we're buying stuff, yeah, we smell them a little bit, but I think it's more beneficial to feed the world when things keep longer and don't spoil as fast. Um, and that's really what's driving, um, the, these modifications um you know it's uh if you kind of look and see what's out there and why it's out there you'll kind of see the trend that um it's there for simplicity um sometimes even for safety factors of not using certain chemicals that were uh, historically har more harmful um but it's but it's also a, there's a production aspect as well uh, that's always underlining uh the modifications that i've seen to this point Thanks um, for taking the time to answer that. Oh, you're welcome, Christine. Um, so this is this is that oxidase again in potatoes. Um, so in this case, uh, they they see the, um, if you if you modify the oxidase in potatoes in this case, um, you can kind of see that the enzyme does not start browning the uh, the the cells once it's exposed to oxygen like the conventional one would. All right, so um, the concerns here, um, allergenicity is a big thing. Um, one of the, one of the, so obviously when you're making GMOs, it's regulated by the FDA. Um, there are certain criteria and uh, standards that have to be met. Um, one of the, one of the things that I talked about was, you know, it can't come from a toxic plant, but it also can't come from a plant that has a high allergenicity factor. So there will never be should say that there isn't right now any plants that have genes taken out of peanut into anything there is there aren't plants that are that have an allergicity of something like um, eggs um, genes from shellfish um, you know not to say that it's going to change it into that organism but um, you know with the potential of triggering an allergic reaction in somewhere that it shouldn't um, that's a huge safety concern. Um, gene transfer is another big one. Uh, one of the, <laughs> it's, it's like, I remember the, 
the the big thing was hey let's develop lawn that you can just that roundup ready lawn and then we don't have to worry about weeds right um and it's better to spray roundup than many other things um out there but the the, the thing is um they don't want to genetic to genetically modify certain things that have a high gene escape potential um so that's why we don't see it in lawns um trying to think of some other examples where that was uh that was a big deterrent um but gene escape is a, is a major factor in uh, making something and in introducing a transgene into a plant. Um, so can we 100% say that GMOs are safe? Um, there are, the GMOs undergo the same tests as medications. I always tell people, um, honestly, and it, and it makes sense that if you're gonna trust the medications you're taking, it would be the equivalent of trusting the genetically modified crop that you're eating. Um, even if you really think about the science behind it, if you're genetically modifying your crop, the goal is to have zero effect on us, um, whether a drug is to have an effect on us. Um, so they're just, uh, there's a lot of um, safety trials that go into it, um, but, uh, but the goal is to not have any safety concerns and in fact, make it safer for us in general. Um, outcrossing, same thing with uh, gene transfer. Uh, resistant weeds and insects that we battle day in and day out. Um, it's a major concern and it's slowing down the whole thought process of increasing production. Um, but, um, but even with these issues, I think if we took away some of those uh, genetically modified crops, um, we would see a drop in production as well. Um, and then um, anti-corporation. Um, you know, it's just because you uh, understand and believe in the, uh, the potential for um, GMOs doesn't mean that you're all for, you know, big companies. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of the same argument of, um, you know, drug companies, right? Um, you know, even with the whole, uh, the whole, the whole fiasco with, um, uh, what was it, uh, the opioids and those companies that abused them. Um, on the population, you know, uh, corporations are corporations and science is science. Um, corporations use technology. Sometimes they develop technology, but um, I think uh, I think it's unfair to assume that um, all corporations are going to be negative. Um, you know, and you know, even even good. Obviously, they're. Um, at least in my eyes, there's a very, there's a very uh, powerful, uh, GMOs are a very powerful thing for humanity, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, corporations are going to see it the same way I am. So um, I think there is a distinguishing line there, um, but it just kind of gets lumped together. And a question that I have that, or a comment, I guess, that goes in with that would be like, if we were all farmers of peanuts and we wanted to form a co-op and sell our own seed and we wanted to use GMO peanut seed and we wanted to brand it ourselves, right. would our co-op have the capital it takes to do all the testing that needs done to market it? Do you think mm -hmm. that that's why more of this GMO seed that we see is under a corporate blanket because and that's where the money is? You know, I honestly, Christine, I think I think that's exactly right. Um, there's a lot of parallel you can make with pharmaceuticals and genetically modified crops. You know, there are, there's some of the same agencies that kind of foresee everything. Um, the FDA is the ones that are going to approve the drug. Um, on top of that, you're going to have patents. Um, so, you know, with patents, then you have. Um, you know, you develop, uh, it, it's just your property. Um, no one else can use it without paying royalties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes, uh, you know, it just, it kind of, I think you can't criticize GMOs without criticizing the pharmaceutical company at the same time. You know, if they, they do things the same way, um, there is a purpose there, but um, you know, you can't say one's good, one's bad because they essentially work in similar manners to be, to be honest with you. Um, and they have to go through the processes similarly. Um, 
and uh, you know you'll see you'll see a lot of these acronyms um, just about in and pharmaceuticals much as uh, foods that we that we take anyway so it's just kind of it's the way the system set up um, I I don't know if there's more um, agencies that regulate GMOs but you know there's a lot here and um, you know it does it gets expensive uh, to make sure that it goes through all the testing um, but it's uh, it, you know it's it's a major concern that you have something out in the food chain that could be toxic and it just kind of goes that way and um, the uh, the the companies and um, and just the way the way things are approved and you know the regulations that are there kind of make it to go that way and this is kind of the way I look at it um, and there was a question in the chat box and I think you're probably okay. going to get to it as we proceed through the rest of the presentation. Um, but Celeste jumped on a little bit late and she said, sorry, I was late. Um, did you cover why some studies have said that GMOs are unsafe? Of those studies, there were like five, less than five um, that documented unsafe or... Right. What um, was up with those studies? You know, um, I am not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what was up with those studies. I'm going to assume that um, it kind of fell into like those uh, those those catch um, those standards with with the allergen allergenicity um, maybe uh, it came from a toxic plant or gene escape or something like that. Um, I'm thinking that it probably fell into one of those categories and they deemed it unsafe. Um, there are some to Celeste that have been debunked as well for not having sound experimental mm -hmm. design and um, some that have been funded by uh, agencies that, you know, don't want the progress of GMOs as well. So there are some studies also that have been debunked because they were, um, what's the word I'm looking for, corrupt. Yeah. They weren't like, really fully science projects. They were, were they had an agenda of their gotcha. own, which I think yeah. anybody could say, you know, but, but those ones were, objected um, from the scientific community because of that right and and you know um and it would be i don't i don't think it would be fair to say that anything's 100 percent safe um you know even even the side effects of medications um tylenol you know something's been around for a long time that we think is no danger could be very dangerous if oh you know if you overdose on tylenol um yeah it's just i you know i I think, you know, in that slide where it actually shows that it's less than 5% out of a, less than five out of a thousand um, tried or out of a thousand trials that have been um, where they, where it was sound science, I, I, I take it, I'm taking it in that direction. Um, you know, those are, those to me are fairly, um, fairly safe in, in terms of what you would expect. I mean, a hundred percent in anything I think is, um, it's about impossible to get, you know, in nature, we see exceptions for everything. Um, anything that we do um, has an unsafe potential in it as well, but it's just, um, you know, like I said, with GMOs, the, the, the goal is to not have an effect on us. Um, and it's all the same regulatory agencies as the drugs that are saving us. Plus follows up with, am I wrong in believing that GMO is expedited crossbreeding? expedited has expedited crossbreeding is it a form like is it comparable to crossbreeding but expedited we did talk about that a little bit yeah earlier, um but there so, are other methods too yeah crossbreeding um it has so so all right so when you take you know think about hybrid corn right um hybrid corn works the way it does because like the gene pool is there that once you cross um two p1 and p2 parent one and parent two, to make your hybrid, you get not only do you get uh, hybrid vigor, but you also get all the genetics lined up so that you get this, this plant that's, that's, um, that, that grows very, very tall and produces a lot of food. Once you breed from that, you start mixing more genes and then you lose some of that, uh, some of those genetics that are providing increased calories, right? So when you crossbreed something, you actually mix more of the genetics 
and um, you you slow down, you, you kind of dilute all those genes that were really beneficial in terms of calorie production. So um, you would have to you'd have to cross them and then breed them further to get to where they were, because you would have to get rid of the stuff that you didn't want. Does that make sense? That's why I was saying. Um, it's such a powerful tool to be able to manipulate one thing without changing anything else. Because if you think about just uh, with the golden rice example, um, if you manipulated the genetics of that rice and now you're growing it differently, um, it's producing less. Um, there's other, maybe there's something else. It's the plants are growing too tall and now the wind's blowing it over. You've lost a lot of the traits that you were breeding for earlier by adding more to that gene pool. So when you genetically modify something, you change one or two genes and you're able to maintain that cultural, um, agricultural uh, um, method to grow it and it doesn't change the, the culture as much. All right, so um, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm at the very end here. We'll get to the questions. Let me just kind of wrap this up here. Um, so, so safety assessment. So what we're talking about those tests, they're gonna focus on toxicity, allergens, um, Let's see, specific components, uh, nutritional toxic properties. So maybe like secondary toxic properties, um, stability of the of the inserted gene, um, nutritional associated with genetic modification, and um, unintended effects, so side effects from that gene insertion. So they're also they also have to identify where the gene is in case they knock something out that's very critical. Um, so, and then with the, with the labeling, um, consumers want transparencies. Uh, food producers say that they want consistency. So they're saying, you know, obviously there's a negative connotation with labeling due to marketing. Um, so the producers are saying, hey, you know, we work hard. We're trying to feed, you know, we're trying to meet our demands of food production. Um, we're trying to do it safely. You know, why should now I label my food as being a GMO when all I'm trying to do is ma maintain the standards and I and it's deemed safe. So now that you put this label on it, pe people are going to be less apt to buy it because of marketing. And I'm gonna say that marketing does a very good job in um, misconception and misleading a lot of people. Um, you know, and that kind of, uh, the, the driving for marketing is profit um, and you know, then it's it's I guess I guess it's up to you to decide whether, um, you know, that kind of adds to the uh, the misconception of things. But you know, marketing um, has driven people that way um, in terms of uh, some false claims and misinformation uh, for 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 an increased profit margin. So that's kind of where consumers and food producers uh, are debating on labeling. That's why it's not such a simple topic. Um, and then here's some more uh, on that. Uh, eliminating GMOs would take a toll on the environment and economies. Um, just, you know, an environment in general, you know, we're talking about, um, so GMOs are using Roundup. I said with GMOs, we got, we're, we're using atrazine less, uh, which has a very long residual, has a higher environmental impact potential. Um, with um, using, using GMOs and uh, in, in, in herbicide, to herbicide uh, tolerance, We've also seen an increase in things like um, cover crop use, uh, you know, um, to be able to uh, to utilize some of these. We're using less till, we're using more no-till. Um, and it's just, uh, it, it, it has had benefits on the environment, I would argue, um, but it's just not something that's uh, typically talked about. Um, so what if all GMOs were eliminated? Um, here are some stats from some studies. Um, 18 million farmers in 28 countries plant about 447 million acres of GMOs. Um, they're doing this for production, for um, demand. Corn yields would go by, down by 10%. Soybeans would decline 5%, cotton 20% almost. Um, uh, to make up for the losses, um, you know, we'd have uh, 252,000 acres of U.S. forest pastures would be have to be converted into cropland, um, and uh, 2.7 million acres globally. Greenhouse emissions would increase due to uh, more passes from uh, from tractors, um, from uh, increased input for decreased output. I guess it's where that's kind of going to. Um, yeah. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Lee Beers and Emily Marison for 
providing a lot of those slides that I used in this presentation. And that's them. Well, that's here. Let me. That's Lee and that's Emily. And uh, the, here's some of the references that was uh, cited. And uh, that's that's all I got, Christine. Uh, but maybe we can get to some of those questions now. I can't really see them in the screen, but maybe if I okay. Well, if you go ahead and exit um, presenter stop mode, you should stop okay. sharing. All right, now I can kind of What I'll do that. now is I'll unmute all the participants. So we have two people that did dial on, in on the phone. Right now, if you're on the phone, you are muted to reduce background noise. I'm going to unmute you. Um, number ending in 500, you are unmuted. And ending in 499, you are unmuted. Um, Celeste, you do not have a, a mic on your computer. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Phil, I'm going to unmute you in case you want to add anything to the conversation here. We do want to thank you all for getting on to the virtual call. I hope that this wasn't too bad for you. Uh, for the most part, everybody hung on till the end. Uh, Dan, I think that that presentation was excellent. Um, I think it went into the, the right amount of depth without being totally overwhelming. Um, so if you guys have any questions or comments that you want to share, please just start with your name and proceed with your question or comment. I'll start. This is Phil. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. How you doing, Phil? All right. Great. Hey, uh, one of the, uh, we you talked about labeling, but one of the uh, ones that really angers me is the uh, label that says non-GMO. And then in the fine print, it says GMO working group, which I think, uh, if you're buying that product, are you contributing uh, to the anti-GMO crowd? Is that correct? Um, uh, well, um, you know, it's like I said, I, don't, I think specific marketing groups have their agendas, just like, uh, you know, we were kind of talking about uh, major corporations, too. Um, I think you know you do the best you can. Um, sometimes you can avoid certain things. Certain things. Sometimes you got to swallow your pride and just you know get it. Um, and I guess I guess the important thing is, you know, I think once people have more and more information, uh, they're able to kind of see past a lot of those things, and uh, maybe they won't be so um, impactful as as a as a negative type of impact. Um, but uh, that's just it. it I mean, it is what it is as far as, um, you know, just the way, the way marketing works, unfortunately. So the, from the, from what I know, which is not very much about this stuff, but I think that the producers who create that mark or who, who grow that product are probably a member of that group. And then they use the group to do the marketing. So I think that they probably pay like some type of dues or have a oh, contract yeah. to be part of that group. So it's not necessarily going directly to the working group, but it does because the people who are part of that production chain are part of the group. Um, for one of the ones that we have a lot of producers in Ohio that are part of the Organic Valley Cooperative, that's a lot of dairy producers are in a cooperative with Organic Valley. And um, I don't have a problem with Organic Valley. I, I don't like the reason why it's marketed as organic. But I do like that they are a cooperative of farmers working together to uphold a standard of production. They're using each other's strengths to build a market for a product that's really struggling. And they are struggling as well. But I do like knowing that that group is a cooperative that's sending more benefits to the farmer than some of the other um, types of groups that have a production contract with a farmer. So. so it's it's uh, more of a, again, it's it's uh, to help the bottom line, basically, with them. They're marketing yeah. to a niche market. I remember talking to a uh, organic uh, milk, milk farmer, um, or dairyman. Um, he was saying, he was saying, you know, um, I, I sell organic milk and my, my, uh, my farm is organic. And it's it's due to necessity. I don't drink my milk because it's too expensive. He goes out and buys conventional milk and only sells his organic milk. Yeah. 
Well, it, you know, I, I'm a beekeeper. We, we have a new, we've invented a new term, free range bees, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah. can put that on my honey label. Why not? There's nothing that says you what? can't. And as long as you don't make dietary claims, you can no. do that. How do, how do you stop them from free ranging? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Any yeah. I know that Dan has an appointment at 10 o'clock. So it's we'll, an important um, one too. <laughs> yeah, we'll wrap it up here soon. But again, thank you all for, for joining us this morning. If you have other questions that come up afterwards, um, please feel free to reach out to either Dan or I. We can relay questions back and forth. Uh, Dan's email was lima.19 at osu.edu. And mine is g-e-l-l-e-y dot two at osu.edu for those of you who are on the phone. Um, so we hope that you will join us for other programming like this in the meantime, while we wait for in-person programming to open up. And keep on your calendar that our next Farm Talk Breakfast is May 15th with an oil and gas topic. And um, we'll hope to see you then. Hey, Thanks, Christine. Christine. How, this is recorded. Can, how, can we watch it again somewhere? Yes, you can. So after I end the recording, this is going to spool in store somewhere, and then I'll be able to share the link to where okay. it is recorded. And you, you can share it yourself for other people to watch it, or you can log back in and, um, and watch it too. Yeah. So, and they're, and they're, typically, the they're typically as a passcode. And I know like some people forget that. Yeah, okay. we, we now have a passcode. It automatically selects a passcode, but I can turn that off. Um, okay. So we'll okay. see what it does. It will automatically default to that now, Dan, if you're recording stuff. I think so, so yeah. Yeah, check that. Because that happened to me. Yep, that's new this week. They started doing that. Oh. So, yes, it will be shared, and I will send it out on the email list as well for people who maybe couldn't join us. Okay. Thank you. Thank I'm going to stop you. recording. All right. Thank you.